All right. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever and whenever you're joining us from. Welcome to yet another episode of Iris Vision's Coaches Corner. Um, thank you all for joining us today. We're so excited to have you here. Um, it is Low Vision Awareness Month for the month of February. So um, with that, I will go ahead and introduce Mr. Tom Persky, who is a pioneer in the low vision community. He, we're gonna learn a little bit about what his life has been like as a partially sighted person, low vision person, and what he's done for the community throughout the years. So Tom, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we're so excited to have you here. So tell us, um, how old were you when you first lost your, your sight? Sure, I was uh, diagnosed uh, right after high school, actually, I was uh, uh, just about 18 years old. And uh, I was thinking back about that just recently, because I realized that um, later that year, we're talking about 1971 now. So we're talking about 50 years ago, I got my first low vision device, which was a plus eight full view uh, glasses where I could read uh, large print. I still couldn't read small print. And uh, I was pretty devastated. I was uh, an art major. And I was also, you know, a sports enthusiast. And many of the things that I enjoyed, um, I was a, a starting to give things up uh, at that time. Uh, probably about age 24 is when I finally uh, had enough of a large central blind spot where I had to stop driving. And of course, for so many of us, you know, with low vision, that's that's where real life really changes. I mean, uh, so thinking uh -huh. back 50 years, so yeah, <laughs> it's been a long journey and uh, a interesting one though, because I feel like throughout the years, as I started to go into the field of low vision and as a as a career, uh, and it took a long road to get there, also. But it sort of meant, meant to be that in my life that I was helping hundreds and thousands of people uh, with low vision uh, and being able to relate. I think you were one of the people that I met. You were a teenager, I believe, when I first met yeah. you. Isn't that true, Myrna? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. I was about 17 years old, something like that. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Almost uh, 20, well, yeah, just about 21 years ago. <laughs> You and I share the Stargardt macular dystrophy as it was our diagnosis and uh, yours came, I know, a little bit earlier, but um, it was, you know, it was quite a shock to me and to my family and we, we didn't have anyone that we knew of that had any vision problems um, in our family. So that was definitely a, a difficult time. Um, I actually had to drop out of school. I could no longer read. I was in um, college at that time and uh, finished a few years of school. And then, you know, just went through uh, uh, just a stage of uncertainty and anger and depression and just didn't know how I was going to function uh, right. the, the rest of my life. And it really took, took time until I finally found out about the Department of Rehabilitation and went to the state of Illinois at that time. And they helped me to um, go back to school. And at that time they purchased your books for you. And I got a, a large reading machine. And I think today of my iris vision and how I use it so much every day and we can take it with me anywhere. Well, back in those days, my reading machine, I call it like the Stone Age. It was like <laughs> this big, heavy machine that, right. you know, like made it out of stone just about. And, uh, but it, it, was a, it was a miracle for me because I could and I taught myself how to read and then later went back to college in my later, later 20s and then um, on to graduate school as a legally blind uh, student. And uh, I enjoyed working with people and my degree was in uh, family counseling at the time. Mm -hmm. And right after that, it was really interesting because I really still had never met anyone with a vision impairment and, or I didn't know anybody who was blind. And I, I decided to start a, a self-help group 
Uh, this is the first one ever in Chicago, and it was in 1983. And it was pretty wild because one of the CCTV salespersons did a mailing for me of all their clients, and we arranged a, a room, and 65 people showed up for the meeting. <laughs> oh, wow. Wow. <laughs> and I, I was, you know, trained in facilitating group therapy, but I never thought I would manage a group of 65 people. <laughs> and, uh, we met once a month for years and years and years, and other people took over. That group actually went on for more than 20 years, actually. So that was my first entree into serving the community of low vision people uh, as I was just volunteering my time. Um, wow, so you went from not knowing anybody to having this room full of 65 people. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was pretty amazing. And just a, a special opportunity came about through in uh, 1987 was when I entered uh, the Dyke Center for Vision Rehabilitation in Wheaton, Illinois. Um, it's currently called the Spectrios Institute where I met Dr. Tracy Williams and Dr. Al Rosenblum. I mean, these, are, these guys are pioneers in the field and um, worked there for almost nine years under their tutelage. And I learned so much from them. Uh, it was a multidisciplinary team. I was uh, actually the director of counseling. Um, and during that time, uh, we were kind of a new uh, center that had used the, uh, an old home we had remodeled for people with low vision. So the, we had contrasting colors and special lighting all throughout the house. And it was, it was a model that uh, caught the eye of many people in the eye care community and I ended up going kind of lecturing around the country uh, because of our new center there. And uh, that, that was pretty, That's pretty, awesome. pretty amazing. One of the projects, uh, I wrote a grant from the Lions, Lions Clubs of Illinois Foundation. And um, to see, uh, we were seeing young children, school-aged children with low vision. Mm -hmm. And we decided um, that the Lions might fund this project, which they said that they would let us see 80 children. And Dr. Williams and Dr. Rosenblum and I traveled to DuPage County where we, uh, did low vision exams for 80 children and the Lions Clubs bought all the devices that they needed, um, telescopes, magnifying lenses, prescription glasses, sunglasses. And uh, they called me back a few months later and they said, Tom, do you think we could do every child in the state of Illinois? <laughs> and I said, oh my gosh, let me think about that. But I'm, I, I'm gonna say yes, I, I'm gonna say yes. So the, again, the three of us um, actually went on a road trip uh, every other week to somewhere, every county in Illinois. And it took us four years and we actually saw and helped 1400 children with oh, low vision wow. in, in the state of Illinois. Wow, and, what an achievement, what an accomplishment. And believe it or not, that program is still to this day continues to be funded by the Lions, uh, Lions Clubs. And uh, so I was very proud to be able to, to be a part of, of that uh, in uh, serving so many children and learning about so many eye conditions that children have and so forth. And then one of the things I really wanted to do was meet other people with Stargardt disease. And uh, with the help of uh, Dr. Gerald Fishman, who is an inherited retina disease specialist. Talk about a pioneer, he, he really was. He took me out to lunch one day and said, I have an idea that um, I'll help you start a little foundation because he was on the, the board of the RP Foundation at that time, but, which he had lots of patients with RP, but he had lots of patients with Stargardt disease. And he, there was no group for them. And so we called, we started uh, a nonprofit called Stargard International back in 1991. Oh, cool. And we had, we had again, about 65 people with Stargards came to our first meeting. Oh my gosh. <laughs> from all over the United States. And most of us had never met only maybe one or two mm -hmm. people. And so there was a lot of hugging, a lot of 
He had like boxes of Kleenex around the yeah, room. Yeah, I, I was gonna say probably a lot of tears going around too. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that foundation grew to we had over two thousand people with Stargardt disease. Oh, and were members of our group and I traveled around the United States and did uh, did meetings for them and with them. Um, it was fun. The National Eye Institute, I remember, had my home phone number and anyone that was diagnosed that would that would call the government and find out information, they would say, oh, you have to talk to Tom. Here's his phone number. <laughs> <laughs> And, I, and all those 2,000 people, I remember having at least a 45 minute to an hour conversation oh with every one of them. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I would imagine people are very excited. I know that I was excited when I met you um, with Stargardt's because like you, I'm the only one in my family who has Stargardt's disease. So it was really cool to be able to meet others who have uh, Stargardt's. Um, there was one other person at the school there for the deaf and blind where I attended that had star guards. Uh -huh. um, uh -huh. Oh yeah. And uh, other than that, you know, it, it was just me. <laughs> and then you <laughs> came and then the, the, the oh, and then there was a couple of students too. So it was like four people in my life that I knew that had star guards when I was younger, but wow, 2000. And I, you know, I love the stories. I love, you know, the, the instant connection, of course, you have with people who finally someone who can understand, you know, right. our families and, and friends, they try to understand, but they really, you know, can't and really um, to be able to be in a room with so many, you know, it was just, mm -hmm. just amazing. Uh, later, um, later that year, yeah. we, um, we were part of a group in Illinois that um, decided to have a national low vision conference. I had been to several conferences for the blind, the American Council of the Blind, the National Federation of the Blind. And I'm like, why are not there a low vision conference? It was kind of something I thought about. And we collaborated with the Chicago Lighthouse, the Department of Rehabilitation, and we decided to have a, a low vision conference, which I was, uh, either co yeah, co-chairman of that particular project. And we, in 1991, we ended up having 800 people came to our meeting and we, we, we had it in downtown Chicago. And we had, I think we charged like $15 <laughs> to come. And we had three wow. days of lectures. We had borrowed doctors from all around the country. Sam Janinski, who invented the CCTV was there. Uh, Ray, Ray Kurzweil came and spoke at our conference. We did that again in 1993. We had about a thousand people. We did it in 95. Uh, it was about 1,200 people. We did it in 1997. It was like 1,400 people from 10 countries around the world that came. And uh, wow. it was just amazing to uh, to then sort of start to educate the whole community um, with the top professionals at that time to be able to come. And we, we mixed it with consumers and, and also professionals mm -hmm. uh, and teachers. And so that everybody was there getting the same information, but also networking and, and it, interacting. And, and that conference was called Discovery, Low Vision Conference. And it was, it was a great, uh, introduction, I think, in the United States for people to be able to come and finally just learn about low vision from everybody's perspective. It was pretty cool. That sounds really cool because a lot of the time people don't understand that there is a big difference between low vision and blind, right? Exactly, so, yeah. Yeah, it's that. that's why I love the month of February with the low vision awareness because it's different for us. It's like we can see but we can't see right <laughs> so <laughs> like ah, you know like i'll tell people all the time yep i'm out jogging or i'm out walking they're like wait i thought you couldn't see you know well yeah i can see i just can't really see i don't know how to explain it <laughs> so that's great that you had a conference there to educate people on that and it was it was really terrific and to to really get to know um all the the top people at that time in low vision from around the country. And uh, just 
right after that, my wife had an opportunity to, with her company to move. And that's when we moved to Arizona in the late nineties. Mm. And um, we decided um, we had never once sold anything in our life. And I said, let's have a little um, store and let's sell some low vision technology. And so we started a company called Southwest Low Vision. And we uh, did that for 13 years as a, as a uh, technology company. We, we also sold magnifiers and lamps and reading glasses. And one of the things I wanted to do was serve areas, rural areas of the state. And so we ended up choosing to do Arizona and New Mexico. And we traveled, we had staff that we hired to travel with us. We had a, a trailer full of low vision devices and we picked about nine different cities. Um, everything from Lake Havasu, Prescott, Arizona to Las Cruces, New Mexico and Yuma, mm -hmm. Arizona. We traveled to all these areas and uh, it was great because we were able to bring people uh, service and technology and sales uh, where the it was very, very difficult in some of these very small rural communities. Uh, that was a very fulfilling time. And mm -hmm. to be able to work together with my wife, who has such a good business uh, head, um, I learned a lot about business because my background was not running a business mm -hmm. at all. It was more, you know, social service. Mm -hmm. So it was a good combination for us. And we, uh, we finally sold the business in uh, 2008. And uh, that was when I heard from the Chicago Lighthouse, the new president at that time was Dr. Janet Slick. And she said, you know, there's one guy in the whole country that I would love to have uh, working with me in Chicago. And I said, the Chicago Lighthouse, I said, you know, I've, I've been there many times. This is really a great opportunity for you. And I was so happy for her. She was a, a low vision research scientist and she said, no, I'm serious. I want to hire you. What do you think of that? And I said, my wife is going to kill me. <laughs> she does not want to live in Chicago. <laughs> she loves Arizona, but she was a real sport. And actually, they ended up hiring her to run uh, the business, business manager for, we had, I think, six or seven low vision clinics throughout Chicago. And uh, so I was senior vice president of uh, rehabilitation services for almost 10 years there before we uh, again moved back to Arizona. And that's when I um, learned about Iris Vision near the end of my time in Chicago. Mm -hmm. And I compared it with many other of these headborne wearable devices that were on the market. And it was great for consumers because they could come to the lighthouse and they could see different brands and they could try them on. And we were selling Iris Vision like 10 to 1 over other brands at that time. Wow. And then they called me and said, I don't know what you guys are doing, but, you know, <laughs> we'd like to understand more. And that's how I first got introduced to, uh, to Frank, uh, Frank Werblin, our founder of Iris Vision and our CEO, Ahmad Khan. And we had many, many meetings and Starting in August of 2017, they hired me as vice president of professional and consumer outreach. My first week on the job, they said, well, we'd like you to go to Australia because <laughs> wow, <laughs> we just sold Iris Vision to the nonprofit organization called Vision Australia. And they're very similar to how we functioned at the Chicago Lighthouse. So, so off I went to Australia and... Uh, uh, it's, I've only looked back now and I think of all the places that I've traveled and, and really enjoyed working with Iris Vision Global and uh, worked in different you know, capacities of, of sales, helping develop the product, uh, helping uh, give my input as a low vision person. And then now that we have coaches that also have low vision, I think I'm very proud of that. Yeah, because I know the presidents of a lot of these companies who have low vision and they, they rarely hire anybody with low vision to be part of their company. There's just a few that uh, that do like human wear corporation, but there's so many that, that really don't. And uh, so 
it's just been a, a, a great a great time in in helping lots of people now we have i know have sold into 16 different countries around the world mm-hmm. and we're still we're still growing we're excited about this year to be able to have the capabilities of actually doing a digital vision clinic where patients will be able to test their left eye, test their right eye, and be able to have information sent to their doctor. So telehealth and telemedicine, we call call it telerehabilitation, is all part of now what we're we're pioneering again. So it's That's it's awesome. been uh, and I look back to my first low vision aid 50 years ago. <laughs> and now it's all come, it's come to fruition. <clears throat> wow, yeah, I, I was thinking about what was my first low vision tool. And um, it was, it's difficult to remember. It might've been the magnifying glasses, but the one I think of that sticks out the most is those um, binocular glasses. You know, the, the, they actually look like binoculars. Right, right. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that they definitely come a long way since then. <laughs> so I, I love Iris Vision. Uh, it's It's been such an amazing journey in general. So I could just imagine what kind of journey you had with Iris Vision as well. Um, if I know that it's helped me out, so I could just imagine how much it's helped you. So, you know, do you use your Iris Vision like on a daily basis yeah. or pretty often? Yeah. I, I especially like to take it with me when I go places. And you know, it has a lanyard that you can just wear around your neck and um, not really walking with it, but being able to have it right handy. So um, especially things like outdoors. I love going to these in Arizona. We have these art and craft shows and classic car shows. And there's so many outdoor events where I really couldn't participate, you know, in the bright sunlight. Uh, being able to see or like a glass case full of uh, jewelry or artwork. There's so many situations in in life where there really hasn't been a low vision device that you could just work at any distance, Mm -hmm. uh, work and you could work hands free. Um, You can go into a darker room like a museum and it gets nice and bright. You go out in the sun where you can't see well and then and it does an auto adjustment and all of these situations in life whether it's an art gallery or a, a concert or a play uh, those are uh, i even use it a lot in the car just riding in the car being able to see things uh it's just so fantastic yeah because, uh, there really hasn't been an opportunity to do that uh with any other type of visual aids right And so um, you mentioned earlier that you had to learn to read again, and I'm uh, talking about learning to read with the CCTV, right? Is that what you were talking about? So it's almost the same thing with Iris Vision, right? You kind of have to learn how to read over again. So what kind of tips can you give uh, our users out there in regard to reading with their Iris Vision on? Well, uh, I always talk about reading uh... 20 minutes in the morning, 20 minutes in the afternoon, and 20 minutes in the evening. I think I've been saying that now for about 15 or 20 years. But it's true with any visual aid, as you're magnifying things close up, um, your eye and your brain uh, don't normally function that way uh, for someone with normal sight. And so when persons lose their vision and they want to be able to read, it's a very difficult transition at first. I always sort of tell the doctors that, It's like one of the hardest things to to really do. So you have to be persistent. Um, I know one of the things we we send to people uh, is a a, a little uh, large print guide with very large letters with extra space in between each line. And then uh, being able to read this two or three times a day where the print gets smaller and smaller and smaller. This is part of what why we call it low vision uh, rehabilitation, because it does take uh, it does take your eye, your brain, and it does take persistence. Also, being able to teach somebody, especially those with macular disease, how to move away from the center and to view things uh, eccentrically, we call it. So, eccentric viewing means looking off the center 
Um, so many people with macular degeneration, they first move their head every time they want to see something on the table and they want to pick up a pen. You see them moving their head. Well, iris vision is a headborne device. So moving your head is really not the best strategy. So when you're first learning to work with iris vision, as you guys know, as coaches, we help people keep their head still mm -hmm. and slowly move their eye to one spot or another where there's always usually one better place that uh, we call it a PRL or preferred retinal locus. There's a spot on your retina that's still functioning pretty well. And being able to go there more and more, con make a conscious effort to practice uh, eccentric viewing. And that takes time because your eye will, if you blink, your eye will go right back to the middle <laughs> right. for, for many, many, many weeks and months. And so you have to learn to, we call fixate and hold that spot and function better and better and better. So you're using the iris vision, but you're also using the visual skills of eccentric viewing. And this all takes time. And I tell people, uh, you're not gonna believe uh, six months from now, how maybe 10 times better, how you're gonna function with this device. A year from now, you're gonna notice so it just takes, it takes a lot of time. And that's what's so frustrating for people. They, mm -hmm. many people like me, you know, I wanted to see good right away, you know, sure. and uh, there unfortunately isn't a device like that, but with persistence and, and with being able to get the training from the coaches, um, I, I think that's really the best uh, uh, approach in, uh, in helping somebody realistically understand what it takes and what expectations are there uh, for you to be successful and to, uh, it'll change your life though, the quality of your life. And as I mentioned in reading and traveling and in all situations. And, and now some of the fun things is taking photographs, uh, be able to go back and see those. When I traveled to Germany, uh, with the Sight City Conference. Ahmad and I went to Germany and I went to some of the art museums. And I was an art major when I was a young man to be able to take a picture of some of those famous paintings with the iris vision. And on the airplane on the way home, it was like I could go back and travel, enjoy my trip. Oh, cool. uh, being able to, uh, to, to do uh, YouTube videos inside the device. Uh, whether right. it's uh, my favorite baseball team or whatever, my history, uh, documentaries, it's just so great to be able to sit and, and enjoy. So right. we look forward to the future, just adding new features like that. And, uh, and because the features are upgradable and they're free to the consumers, we just think it's a, a great opportunity for so many to try Iris Vision. <laughs> absolutely absolutely so um for those of you out there who have reading as your uh top goal just know as tom mentioned it's going to take time it's going to take patience because it is one of the more challenging skills to master with your iris vision so um be patient with yourselves and practice as tom suggested um but that's pretty much it for today's coaches corner everybody Thank you so much. I hope you all enjoyed this session, uh, this episode. I hope you found uh, uh, some value in it. I know I did. Um, next time we're going to have the other coaches join us. So looking forward to that. Um, so bye for now, everybody. Take care. Take care, Myrna. Thanks, Tom.